welcome to the second game. So, before we start, there's some news that I'd like to break. Well, not really news, but more like tentative news, I guess. So, I may or may not be playing in another tournament later on this month. It's called Northumbria Masters. There will be nine rounds, which is a lot. I probably won't be making videos for those because yeah i'm struggling with like <laughs> finding time to to make these current five videos as is and then to add another nine on top of that is insane i might just pick like one or two games which i find interesting from there and upload it but yeah i mean it's all tentative anyways i don't really know if i am going to be going but there is chance a small chance we'll say I realize I shouldn't be broadcasting this type of information on the internet, you know, like future plans where I'll be, stuff like that. But I don't think I'm famous enough for, for that to be like an actual problem. Well, at least not yet. And oh my god, next tournament, whatever the next tournament will be, I'll definitely be going in in full gear for next time. Cat ears, everything. Just go for maximum disrespect. Anyways. Let's get started with the game. I'm playing black against um, Elmira Walker. She's a pretty strong player, above 1700, so I am a bit scared. I'm also playing as black here, so yeah. And preparation-wise, I found out that she plays e4, and against that I go c5, the Sicilian, specifically the Accelerated Dragon. And yeah, there was one game... Uh, of hers that went into the accelerated dragon and she lost quite badly actually she didn't play the correct optimal moves and she seemed to struggle a lot in that game um, so the plan was to just hope that she didn't learn from her mistakes which is wishful thinking really um, honestly I just didn't want to learn a new opening like what I did last game anyways so the game begins and here I'm already setting up the accelerated dragon with g6, c4. This is one of the moves that just effectively kills the accelerated dragon. So this is why g6 isn't played much at the higher levels, 16% compared with 58%. And then if you go to g6, you'll see that c4 is one of the most common replies by master level players because they understand that c4 is just objectively the, the best way to play or counter the accelerated dragon now you may be asking why is this my opening despite it being objectively bad i mean look 18 percent win for black is, is just crazy compared to like everything else so allow me to explain these are master level games if we switch to lee chess we see the exact opposite trend here c4 very low on the list fourth most common move it says 12 percent here but in my personal experience i've only ever encountered c4 like five percent of the times so yeah online i do very well with this opening i'm happy with it i get good positions out of it because for some weird reason online people don't like c4 but yeah i'm playing an over the board tournament these people are more serious it's a different demographic so i should have expected c4 to be to be coming honestly and I sort of did, I, I prepared for c4, but that was like a long time ago, like two months ago, I'd like to say, or three perhaps. But honestly, I didn't retain much of that knowledge, so basically I was, I was playing blind here. Um, I just repeated like what I normally would play against non-c4 moves. d6, knight there, knight there, bishop here, which if I had remembered my prep that day, I would have immediately identified this as a mistake because after the game was over and i was just reviewing the game and re-reviewing like my c4 lines i discovered like oh yeah this was in my prep and this was a mistake and i could have punished this so this is a mistake uh basically it's a uh, an incorrect move order if you want to play bishop e3 you should play f3 first in order to prevent knight g4 so yeah, e2 is the most popular move, and if you want to play f3, then you could as well, that's also an option. And then yeah, let's see, bishop g7, and then yeah, bishop e3 next is what you should play. So yeah, if you want to play bishop e3, 
f3 first is essential. Why is it essential? Because you want to stop knight g4. Why do you want to stop knight g4? Because I'm um, attacking the bishop, which you really don't want to lose as white, because then my bishop gets free reign over this super awesome diagonal, and you can't like oppose or counter it. So you may say that's no problem, let's just move the bishop away, like here, or maybe back here. But then queen comes in, and you're just in big trouble. You can't move this knight, because... You just get checkmated and in addition to that i'm also attacking this b2 pawn it's essentially a fork between these two pieces the best move for white in this position is knight takes and then now you can move your bishop away from the attack of the knight because queen b6 no longer comes with the same idea you're no longer pinning the knight over here so yeah and then you can just play like queen here to defend these two pawns so yeah bishop moves away let's say to f4 and in this position g7 over here is a very tricky move that black can try i think the usual instinct for most people is to kick the knight away but in fact both of these moves are losing and that has to do with one of the main strengths in black's position here which is the open b file i mean just just look at all of this there's there's so much potential here like tactic wise for example h3 then we can do a sacrifice knight takes king takes check a fork between the king and the pawn let's say king moves back queen takes and this knight's just gone it's double attacked so you can't defend it and if you move the knight away then queen takes rook and yeah i'm just winning an exchange so that should be a win for black at that point okay what about f3 you do the same thing knight here also worth mentioning is you can't ignore the knight as well, because the knight is forking the queen and the rook. So you are sort of forced to take it, and then it is the same thing again, really. So yeah, that was all knight prep, which I forgot, which is a shame, because I could have potentially pulled off the knight takes f2 sack in an actual game, in an actual tournament, which would have been super cool, but alas... I did not do my due diligence with preparing, so yeah, I just played normally, I didn't see or didn't remember this knight g4 move that I had, so yeah, she plays uh, f3, again, it was the wrong order, could have punished it, but too late for that now, castles, queen there, bishop here, all normal stuff, knight e8, now let me explain, I was desperately trying so hard to just remember just something something from my c4 preparation and then vaguely i sort of remember this knight e8 move with the idea of rerouting this knight to e6 now the computer is not a fan of this idea at all it's not even suggesting it in one of the top five moves i don't know i must have just been hallucinating this idea regardless it's not one of the worst ideas as well so yeah, I went ahead with the idea. Mm, here I trade it first. Because I want my knight to jump in to e6 with tempo attacking the bishop. If trades, then I do accept that because she weakens her dark squares quite a bit by trading off the bishops. So yeah, trade happens and I would, I would just love to get my queen in to the game with tempo by exploiting this dark squared diagonal here. Unfortunately, she probably saw that and went knight d6, preventing the development of my queen. So yeah, I think it's kind of obvious. I want to get rid of the knight, so bishop c6, getting ready to trade. She goes b4, which is a good move, because now I realize I can't trade, because white has e takes d. Now if I could get my queen in with check, place it in the center and let this trade happen then black's just completely fine here maybe, maybe even slightly better but unfortunately white has c5 which is insane this b4 move protects the c5 pawn push just insane and this is the only saving move for white anything other than c5 like i said just turns into a draw so I'm thinking, well, okay, b4 just killed my idea, but maybe her idea with b4 was to go one step further and play b5, which would be totally good for me, because then she'll no longer have this c5 defensive resource. So let's say, for example, rook c8, pawn push, bishop takes, takes, queen check, 
this doesn't work because of queen takes and if you move your king out of the way then i bring my queen to the center we do a trade and black's just completely fine here so yeah i was really hoping that b5 was her intention here that this was her plan so yeah at this point i was just shuffling my pieces around just waiting for her to play b5 so yeah rook c8 she didn't play b5 okay let's just shuffle around a bit more rook e8 again she didn't play b5 and i'm just like fine i'm not shuffling around any longer bishop takes so yeah i was fully expecting e takes d here since probably she's aware of this queen idea that i have in which case okay e takes d i have to move the knight away since queen b6 doesn't work and then this is just super miserable for me i would probably resign in like a couple more moves i mean the accelerated dragon had zero chance against the Morozi in the first place so i wouldn't really have been mad or anything i, I brought a knife to a gunfight essentially like this is the expected outcome but to my surprise she played c takes d now we've seen the importance of the c5 move in stopping my whole idea here the only route to the redemption that i have so yeah this one tiny mistake and she just threw all of her advantage away and yeah this is i'm just fine here even slightly better dare i say so yeah my plan at this point was to just play a couple more moves and then ask for a draw my rook was under attack i didn't want to trade it because that would give up control over the c file so i blocked the bishop and over here i should have played f takes e this is just completely fine for me but instead i had to be fancy and i went f5 which is a pawn sacrifice a temporary pawn sacrifice because after it takes takes then i'm gonna recapture the pawn here or so i thought so we have takes takes and then i realize okay i can't take with the rook because then my rook's hanging i can't take with the knight because then my pawn is hanging so what i came up with here is king f6 and i thought that was completely fine the king defends the pawn so i have knight takes pawn next turn essentially just reclaiming the pawn that i sacrificed and everything will be fine however rook d1 something that i didn't really see you're essentially pinning the knight not allowing it to move since if it does then you take the d pawn so i have no choice but to defend the knight how do i defend the knight well there's only one way so rook c4 and i thought okay we're still fine instead of taking it with the knight which we can't do because it's pinned we'll just take it with the rook instead g3 now i thought the idea was to go bishop g2 to attack the pawn but i thought this was still completely fine for me because rook takes bishop here knight goes back to block but what i didn't see was bishop d5 forking the two rooks so yeah that i completely missed she played a different yet equally dangerous move bishop f1 attacking the rook and the rook can't go anywhere because that drops the knight so i only have one move here which is knight e2 to block the bishop which isn't ideal because white has bishop takes rook takes rook takes and i lose a pawn now at this point i was just cursing myself for playing f5 this stupid fancy move which i thought worked but just made things a lot more complicated like this move just sucks because you end up with these split pawns that are unprotected and you can see white exploiting these weaknesses throughout the game which led to a lot of these unnecessary complications now if you contrast that to acting like a normal person and taking the pawn then these pawns are connected and you just don't have as big of a weakness it, sh it should have been obvious to me but but i got tricked by how fancy this move was so yeah let's go back to where we were so bishop takes she chose to get the extra pawn and then I'm just thinking, I'm screwed here, aren't I? But then again, I started thinking a bit more, and I'm not super helpless in this position. I found two different options. One of them was rook e1, rook takes, king takes, essentially just dissolving the, the rook battery here that white has. I'm still down upon, but maybe I can hold a draw somehow if I'm super careful and really good with my endgames. 
the other option was to just go double the rooks on the seventh rank and target this pawn, go for a perpetual. The only problem is that white has check and rook takes, defending the pawn. So I'm like, okay, shit, this, this doesn't work then. But then I thought again, and now that I'm thinking about it a bit more, what can white do in this position? This rook can never leave the back rank. If it does, there's just checkmate. This king can't go anywhere because I just check. If the king goes back, then I move my rook back. That's a repetition. If you go forward again, I just bring my other rook in and then it's a perpetual. I just swing my rooks back and forth. This rook can never leave the h-file because if it does, then rook takes, the other rook comes in and we're just gonna do the same thing. We're just gonna swing the rook back and forth and then get a repetition that way. So yeah, everything is paralyzed. The king and both rooks here are paralyzed. The only thing you can do is push your pawns, but then they'll just get gobbled up, so there's really no point. And so in this position, I, I took the pawn, and then I asked for a draw, and she accepted. Now, her mistake was thinking that this was a free pawn. It is not a free pawn, because it comes at the cost of allowing my rooks to double up on the 7th rank. Or the second rank in this case, which is a big no-no. Rooks on the second or seventh rank are super super powerful, as well I have demonstrated in this game. So she did have a better move, which is to add pressure to the knight. Now this may seem like a good move at first since, well, you're adding pressure to the pinned piece. However, if you think further ahead, then you'll see that black has rook e4, which simultaneously unpins and defends the knight. However, if you go one more layer deep, then you'll realize that the real motive behind rook d2 is not to add pressure to the pinned piece, but rather as a baiting move. You're baiting black to play rook e4. Well, why do you want black to place their rook onto this e4 square? That's because grand reveal you can swing the bishop back to g2 winning this b7 pawn furthermore you're also threatening bishop c8 which attacks this rook if this rook moves out of the way then white has rook takes d6 so you're losing two pawns you're essentially using this this idea of adding pressure to the pinned knight as a platform to jump over and shift to this new well real idea real motive that you have which is to attack this b7 pawn and allow the bishop to infiltrate black's ranks insane idea so yeah that was the game game two ended in a draw it's a very fortunate draw since i by all means should have lost this game i mean i was lost out of the opening and even after i recovered from the opening i played this stupid f5 move in the end game which should have cost me the game but well, by a miracle, the idea she had to find was pretty hard to spot, so I was saved by that. But yeah, that's the end of game two. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.